Welcome to Optimal Game State. Today we're going to be talking about the new addition of Kill Team and the new PvE mode it has, which is called Joint Ops. If you've been following the channel, you'll know that the various solo play formats are of great interest to me. I'm also a big fan of co-op play, so the idea of being able to sit down at a table with my buddies and, you know, put down a couple of Space Marines and then go in against wave after wave of Tyranids sounds like it could be a lot of fun. And that's not just because my social media is currently filled with screenshots from Space Marine 2 right now. Now, we did have a single article on Warhammer Community, which gave a few details of this new play mode. Um, but in this video, I am going to be talking about a little bit more than is in that one article. And that's because Orion Leaks did give us the full details from the Hive Storm, Hive Storm box. Now, honestly, the article is 90% of the info we needed, but the leaks did answer a few open questions, largely about what content is not provided and how, kind of how far it goes. So the first thing to understand is that this format isn't yet fully formed. This system is pretty basic, the options are quite simple, and there's no campaign system along with it. So you don't string games together one after the other, you don't have like injuries, you don't collect XP or extra weapons. It is literally just take your kill team and play it out against a, um, an AI. Um, indeed, the very first paragraph in the write-up for this mode does say that this should be considered an introductory mission pack and that the plan is to expand this concept out further down the line. So hopefully we are going to be seeing some you know, more missions, more details and stuff kind of rounding it out probably in a white dwarf. Um, I'd love to see them do a kind of a dedicated book to this, but I think maybe the occasional white dwarf article is what we can expect. All right, so keep that in mind. This, is, this isn't fully formed. It is kind of the bare bones of it. And, you know, you know it, it's enough. It's enough to work with. Okay, let's start with kill team selection. So this happens as normal if you're playing solo. So you pick your kill team, pick your normal operatives like you normally would. If you're playing a two-player co-op, what you would do is you would split one kill team between these. So you have the operatives uh, split kind of 50-50 or however you want to do it. There is an option for that to be two different kill teams if you want. So each player would take half of a particular kill team. So in this case, you can see that um, you know one person has taken some kind of Aquilian troopers and the other has ended up with some space marines. This could end up with some very, very powerful combined lists. So if you take all the specialists and heavy weapons from two teams and leave the basic troopers behind, then you're going to get a really powerful list. That said, and this is going to be a common theme throughout this video, do remember that you're playing solo and co-op. So all it really matters is if you're having a good time. No one is going to care if you break some rules. So really don't sweat that kind of thing. Um, if you find something that you think is going to be enjoyable, go with it. Um, but yeah, do keep in mind that um, the baseline is assuming you're just going to run a kill team as a kill team. Now, this is, yeah, if you're like me, you're going to want to stick to that. Uh, it's good to have those baselines um, and try color inside the lines, as it were. That's where I have my most fun. And that's the kind of game I'm going to be approaching into. Now, this particular setup, I think, looks great. So if you were giving a intro game and you're able to play a couple of kind of weak troopers, you can show the, the person you're introducing to the game how you know you move, how you shoot. And then when they get a chance, they're going to be they're going to be activating some space marines. And you know, they're going to be hitting for more, they're going to be hitting more often, doing more damage, you know, they're going to get to attack twice, stuff like that. Like that, that's probably a cool feel. So I do think that is something that could be a lot of fun. And obviously, narratively, it does make a lot more sense. It also means you get to kind of flex and you get to kind of have interesting combinations. And don't forget that you can also um, substitute. So, uh, you know, if you don't necessarily have the right models, you can play a kill team. Again, this isn't at a tournament. There's not going to be anyone stepping in and say, you've got the wrong models. So think of the story and think about having fun. That's the real priority here. Okay, let's talk about some of the rules. Enemies do not use normal kill team profiles. Instead, they have some generic ones to pick from. And these are two that appeared in the article. This means you can use anything from your collection. You don't have to worry about picking up specific kits. 
The enemy models are referred to as NPOs, so non-player operatives. There are six generic profiles to choose from. So there are three brawlers. You can see that one on the left is a brawler. The brawlers are melee focused and they really just want to get in close combat. Then you've got three marksman profiles. So the marksmen are those one, you know, they're looking to line up a shot and shoot at you basically from range. So brawler and marksman, two splits. Each of those will have three different categories. So you've got a trooper in both, um, which is the lowest wounds at seven and is lightly armored at five plus. You have a midpoint profile, which can soak up a little bit more damage and inflict a little bit more pain. For the brawler, that's called a tough, so that's one on screen. And then for the marksman, it's called a warrior. So they both have a four plus armor save, uh, 10 wounds for tough and eight for warrior. Then finally, you have an elite option in both of them called a heavy. So do we have the details for that here? Yeah, so you can see it's got 14 wounds. It's got a three plus save and it does have an APL of three, which means it's got three actions rather than all two. Um, and then through those three levels, so going from trooper to that midpoint to heavy, um, the damage is increasing. So there's going to be damage and the accuracy. So at the low tier, they're hitting on four plus, and then the damage is going to be three, four for melee and two, three for ranged. The mid tier hits on the same, but the damage is a little bit better. So you can see there it's four or five damage for the broader. And, and then at the top tier for the heavy, um, you can see that the, the hit is now three plus. So, you know, they're probably doing similar damage to the mid tier, but they're hitting more lightly. So that's it. You just have those kind of three combinations, or those six combinations. So it's either melee focused or it's a range focus. And then, you know, the, the, the amount of damage, how often it hits, and the, the wounds go up on kind of scale like that. So initially, this does seem pretty limited. But then again, the rules do suggest that you create your own versions using the kill teams as a guide. The Tempest, the Tempest Aquilians, for example, so that's the Imperial kill team from Hive Storm all have profiles very similar to that of a marksman warrior. The trooper matches almost exactly. Um, so yeah, let's have a look. Yeah, and you can see, the, so the trooper has four attacks, uh, hits on a three plus and does three, four damage. That's actually slightly better than all the warrior, which would only do hit on a four plus normally, um, but everything else is the same. So you've got the same uh, APL, you've got, who do we have the same move? Yes, you've got the same move, six, um, and then you've got the same armor team, four, and you've got the same wings of eight. Uh, so, you know, they're very, very similar, but this has some extra abilities um, and is a little bit more reliable to hit. To me, this does kind of suggest that these MPO templates that we have here are similar to the baselines that a design team might use to create kill teams. I, I think that's pretty cool. Now, for the previous edition, I did do a video uh, which was called Understanding Operatives. And basically, we looked at kind of the, the variety that you have out there. And we ended up with kind of with like a, a similar sets. So you can see that with those light, medium, and heavy armor brackets, which are represented by the 5 plus, 4 plus, 3 plus, respectively. Um, and then there seem to be three wound brackets. So often the humans were 7 to 8, the Xenos were 8 to 10, and then the Astartes were 12 to 16. Um, and then you could see across the various firearms, typically damage was relatively consistent. So last guns and fists. We're all two, three damage, while bulk guns and chainswords more like three, four. And then, you know, the big end weapons like the plasma guns would be a four, five. All relatively consistent across the variety of profiles and honestly kind of match what we have here. One of the interesting things about this is the kill team balancing system is done internally within each kill team. So you can have powerful operatives as long as there's a weak operative in the same kill team to kind of balance it out. Uh, so yeah, often you kind of see um, elements that make narrative sense. So the damage across uh, operatives will tend to be similar and um, the amount of wounds tend to be similar to kind of get the feel uh, for the characters rather than worrying about too much about points. And then they can kind of round it out with abilities like we have here. So we got the rapid insertion for the swift landing um, to kind of draw in the, the, the balance between the various uh, factions. Okay, so with that in mind, if we wanted to make an MPO with a plasma gun, what we could use is the normal warrior MPO profile and then just add in the plasma gun attack line from the Aquilian gunner. So we are able to meddle around with a few of the numbers. 
um, to kind of get what we want out of these fighters because there aren't any points. There aren't any scores. And obviously because we're playing PVE, so we're playing against the game, we don't necessarily have to worry about too much of a balance. We just need to set up an interesting scenario. Um, and yeah, you can kind of fine tune things if you want. So after adding this um, profile, if we decided that we want them to hit a little bit better, you know, we could uh, alter their hit rate. Um, that you could change that that hit to a four plus if we felt that maybe that's too good for them. Um, and obviously we can drop wounds if we want to be more like a glass can or something like that. So yeah, again, the goal here, because we are playing solo or playing co-op, isn't necessarily to make things balanced, but instead kind of get the right team and feel. We want Space Marines to feel like Space Marines. We want a Grot to feel like a Grot. Now, one of the profiles in there does have some options. The Trooper Marksman has a special weapon selection that you can take. Um, but there is a limitation on that. Only one in every three Troopers can have that. Now, there is a little bit of vagueness on this. Um, so I think this means that you can pick one and give it a special weapon. Or you could get four and have two of them with special weapons. So if you can see what I mean there. But it's also possible that the intention was to have the other way, where you would need to get two normal firearms before you upgraded that third one. So yeah, that isn't really clear in this currently. Um, I think it's unlikely we're going to get an FAQ on this because you rarely get FAQs from non-competitive content. Uh, really, you can kind of play it any way you want. Um, Again, I do like coloring inside the lines. I do like those lines clearly defined. And I think it's good, as I'll talk about this a bit later, to have missions that two people can play separately, independently, and get a similar experience so they can actually compare notes and they can talk about it. So this is something I would like to be kind of set out. Um, I suspect the best way to approach this is to take two of the normal firearms first before you get your third one. But, you know, that's not how the current kill team um, options work if you're uh, doing the, the normal kind of PvP mode, if you want to call it that. Anyway, let's move on. So with every version of solo play, one of the key elements is the enemy AI. The version here is decent, if not super detailed. So we have the broad idea of a threat principle which essentially says, go with the option that's worst for you. Uh, so this gives some pointers on how to resolve some situations. So there's activation priority. So that'll um, help you work out which uh, MPO should activate next. Um, and the order for that essentially goes, step one, find the MPO who can do the most damage right now. Then step two, find an MPO not in cover and hence at risk of taking hits. And finally, step three, look for one closer to the player operatives. It's not perfect, but it is solid. Um, I think this might have benefited from a flow chart or something like that. Again, it doesn't need to be super detailed, but it is nice to have a guide and kind of keep things as simple as possible for the players and uh, reduce the number of options they have to make. So, you know, at the very end of it, I would like to have seen, um, you know, if they're equidistance and, you know, they're doing the same now, and you kind of get to the end of it, you still have two or three, just randomly decide, something like that. Once you've worked out which of your MPOs to activate, you check one of these two behavior tables. So this depends on whether they're a brawler or a marksman. Now this does mean that there is gonna be the option, if they wish, uh, for the developers or designers to add in another category. So they could add in like a, a leader, a controller, something like that, and then have, have different options and different profiles for it. Um, but yeah, right now we've got the brawler, we've got the marksman, and we've kind of got these actions here. So what will happen is each time you get to activate, each time you've got an action, you're going to step through each of these four to determine exactly what you're doing next. So the, if you have a brawler, for example, then that's going to be the fight, charge, reposition, and dash in order. So if they aren't yet melee, but have a targeted charge, for that first action, they will check, they'll go through it, they'll see if they can fight, they can't, they'll see if they charge, they can charge, so they'll take that action. Then for the second activation, or action, because they'll have two, it, they will go back to the top. Can they fight? Yes, they can fight, so they will fight. Obviously, you can't um, do the same thing twice, unless there's a special rule that lets you. Um, interestingly, if they're already in combat, 
the first thing they'll do is fight. They'll take that one option. But then after that, they can't charge. They can't well, they can't fight again. They can't charge. They can't reposition. They can't dash. The only really other, other option they would have had would have been to fall back. But that isn't on his behavior table. So they'll just end up passing that second action, which makes sense. And, um, you know, the brawlers are going to try to get into combat. It doesn't mean you might have some interesting situations where, you know, they might... Is it legal? I don't think it's legal for them to reposition and then charge. Um, yeah, so you, you're probably going to get a couple of cases where maybe it's not great, uh, but that's fine. And it does talk about cover here. So yeah, for movement, so reposition and dash, the behavior table gives a little bit of guidance on how to manage it. Um, so largely the brawler is just looking to get into melee or stay in cover, while the marksman is looking to line up a nice shot from cover if possible. Again, we are relying pretty heavily on the idea here that the players are playing the MPOs as best they can. Now, I do feel where possible we should be removing as much of the mental load from the players. We want them to focus on playing their operatives after all, not both sides. So I do think this is something that can be developed a little bit better, but that's okay. Now, one concept I do like that comes from the Stargrave series of games is to have a point of interest on the board. And that's something that the MPOs will move to if in doubt. So these kill team rules do use objective markers as a potential target for reposition and dash, which is quite similar. But as we'll see later, out of the three missions they've given us so far, so the three that are in this book that are to be used with joint ops, only one of them actually has objectives. So this behavior point doesn't actually work because there's only you know one in three, or only one of them where you're actually going to have it. They probably should have considered putting something similar to it. Um, so yeah, I mean they 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 would put a point on the map for the for the MPOs to be interested in if they have a situation where they can't see any enemies and they don't know what's going on. It just yeah, you kind of end up with a couple of weird situations sometimes. Like I think a good one would be where you have the MPOs in a nice firing zone set up, and they probably should stay put. Um, you know, so in in this case. Yeah, maybe your your best option then is to endlessly reposition and dash to cover, but only move zero inches. Anyway, so there there might be some kind of niche cases like that where you have to kind of consider and think about. It. One thing I also would have liked to have seen is patrolling rules. Now Necromunda does have a set of rules around sentries because that you can have scenarios where um one gang is trying to infiltrate a base and not get spotted. And I think that would have been something perfect for the kill team format. Now, usually on those missions, something goes wrong and eventually the guards hit the alarms and summon more troops. But with a co-op game of kill team, where it is just you versus uh, the game, uh, you might in theory have a scenario where, you know, your kill team are able to silently take out the patrols and complete the mission with stealth rather than going in all guns blazing. I think that could be like a fantastic way of playing it and would really um, highlight uh, the kind of the conceal element of uh, kill team, which is quite unique. Okay. And that might be something we see in an upcoming White Dwarf article. So there is a potential. There's lots of opportunity for uh, Games Workshop to expand this out. And um, yeah, I think they've got a kind of a solid shell to work from for here. For shooting and fighting, we do have priority target selection. So who do they target? When shooting the MPOs, uh, will, they will always try to get the clearest shot. Uh, then targets control and objectives. Uh, then the closest, then wounded, then ready. The fight action is similar, so you go for wounded first, then controlling objectives, and then ready. There probably should be something in there for tiebreakers at the end, even if that's just say roll a dice. Um, I just want to avoid cases where the player is forced into, you know, making a decision to themselves that um, could feel bad, you know, when you're basically ending up putting all your effort into thinking how the uh, enemy team could screw you over the most. So I want to remove as much of that. It's still fine to have that kind of principle of, you know, do as much harm to yourself as you can take the worst possible option for you. But at the same time, sometimes you can kind of take that out and like just have a random selection. That's good too. Um, now there is a potential problem in here. And I think this, I think the fact that they're looking at wounded 
is a mistake. Being wounded is a binary state. So if you've taken any damage at all, you're considered wounded. And otherwise you're not wounded. Similarly, injured is when you've got fewer than half your starting wounds. Now you could factor in wounded for the MPOs so that they, oh, sorry, so that they focus, sorry, injured, not wounded. You could factor in injured so that they focus on, uh, on non-injured first, kind of uh, try and get as many of the uh, players operatives injured where they're going to get penalties. Alternatively, you could do the reverse where they'll try focus on the injured fighters first to try and get them down, try and kill them. Overall though, I'm tempted to suggest that they should include weakest armor and then lowest wounds remaining rather than just looking at injured um, or rather than just looking at wounded like they currently are. So this is to kind of get the MPOs to focus fire on the targets that are easier to kill rather than just, um, you know, the big heavy who has taken one single wound. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and is now considered wounded. So they'll be on 13 with like a great armor save while there'll be a, an untouched target that's only sitting on eight wounds with, you know, a five plus save. It'll be much easier to kill. Anyway, that's something that we could factor in. I think once I get around to playing this myself and writing it up, I think I will I will go for that. So if I go back to the shooting, um, so when they can get the clearest shot, yeah, sounds good. Targets controlling objectives, sure then closest, and then wounded, then ready. So I'd probably replace that wounded with um, lowest, yeah, with easiest kill. So that would be first um, number of wounds remaining, and then uh, the weakest armor save. Well, you might even consider backing it a little more. Anyway, I'll look that once we get to it. The threat principle does have rules on how to select your target in close combat, as we've just mentioned. Um, but it doesn't actually say how to resolve those fight dice. Now, shooting is straightforward, but in a fight, in a melee fight, an MPO can choose to strike or parry, and we don't have any guidance at all for that. Typically, there is a best case option. Um, so you're going to strike if you can kill the opponent no matter what they do. You'll parry if that means you survive and otherwise it wouldn't, and you'll strike if you're going to die anyway, and you might as well go down swinging. So... I've always kind of felt that this system is a little bit of a false decision. It makes you feel like there's a little bit of interaction going back and forth, but really there's always a best case option for each side. And, you know, if you give it a little bit of thought, you should work it out. And you're kind of, you know, after the dice rolled, you're kind of hoping your opponent's going to make a mistake and not pick the optimal choice. It's a bit strange. Anyway, in this case, my recommendation would be to have a guideline so that there's no, we don't have to, again, force the, players to kind of think both sides and instead what i would recommend doing is having the mpos always strike regardless so that does make them a little bit more reckless it probably means they're more likely to get killed and you know in that regard it might make things a little bit easier for players but hopefully we're gonna have a lot of scenarios where it's going to be throwing you know endless waves of um, mpos and you know trying to to swarm down the good guys as it were and this keeps it simple. So if you're always going to strike, then you don't have to worry about the back and forth. You can kind of focus on playing your own game. There are three co-op missions detailed in um, in Hivestorm. So the pack they have has Breach, Sabotage, and Escape. Each have two maps, one for the Galadar terrain and one for more open kill zones. I actually was expecting this to have terrain from the Hivestorm box built in. But the maps are just general deployments and the objective details uh, are there with no terrain laid down so you can run anything that you have quite frankly uh, now each mission has a special set of mission rules and a victory condition the victory condition usually relates to the mpos so that's the number of wounds that you'll have in the npo kill team so in this case, what they're doing is they're using wounds as a stand-in for a point calculation. And I guess because, you know, you've got very static and kind of basic ones, you can kind of get away with that. The breach mission, for example, has 90 worth of wounds for the MPOs. So you could have just 12 warriors um, or you could have six heavies, uh, both of which come to about 84 wounds. Now, for reference, the Tempest Aquilian kill team is about 90 points in, or 90 wounds in total. 
Um, but that'll come with special rules, equipment, command points. And as I was saying, they they hit slightly better um, than the normal troopers. So that mission should be relatively easy with the players having a big advantage. So I think looking at these missions that the players should be, you know, at a good um, advantage. So hopefully they should be fun and achievable. Um, but, you know, I think we could quite easily uh, spice things up with some extra rules and maybe some uh, tougher opponents. The victory conditions that they have in these missions tend to be quite straightforward and they don't actually have that normal four turn limit. So depending on how it plays out, you could end up burning through a in a super fast game or you could spend it all night. This is typically how solo and co-op games approach things and the goal here really is to have a satisfying ending rather than counting victory points. The three missions involve uh, killing all MPOs for breach, interacting with three objectives for sabotage, and getting at least 50% of your kill team over the enemy board edge for escape. All pretty classic scenarios. For breach and sabotage, you lose a mission if all of your oper operatives are incapacitated. And with escape, if you get to the point where 50% of the starting crew are dead, then even though the game will technically continue for a bit longer, you can't win anymore. Now, I suspect if a game is going badly for you, you'll end up conceding well before you get to this situation. You don't have to play it out. You can just restart the mission and try again, hopefully having learned from uh, you know, the mistakes. Currently, I'm not aware of any campaign options where you would carry wounds or rewards from game to game. Um, that's often used as an incentive to kind of keep going and keep at it. Uh, but in this case, yeah, there's, there's no need to. So if you're having a good time, you keep playing. And if you're not enjoying it, then I think you just settle up the game and, and then uh, maybe do a fresh one. None of the deployments really explain where the MPOs deploy, although the sabotage mission does have some reinforcement points. Now, they do have areas, is what I'm saying, but they don't necessarily say put you know half your kill team in this section, half your kill team in the other section. It's just normal. Um, they just look like normal deployment maps for a normal game of kill team where you know an experienced kill team veteran might have opinions on where to place things now again i don't want I, i'd like to avoid cases where players are really really focused on um playing the other side right now we can do that we can sit down and we can play you know a 2v or 1v1 game and have one player control both sides it's not enjoyable it's not fun it's something you can do but you want to kind of that's why you need to have kind of a solid AI in there to kind of take away all of that um, mental load from the other side. You want to be able to build focus on your side, kind of winning your game. Um, now, not having those detail points does kind of make some sense because they don't know what your collection is going to be. So, you know, you can have, you can end up running very, very different kinds of forces. Um, but at the same time, it does mean, like if you're doing the escape mission, if you're setting up all of your MPOs on one side of the board, and then you could put your kill team on the other side and then run them down quickly at a range. Now, I think chances are people aren't going to do that because obviously, you know, it's their own fun. They want to have kind of a fun game. I don't think that sounds like a fun game. But again, as someone who likes to cuddle within the lines, I would like to have a bit more of an idea of what should go where. So, you know, they could say 50 50 in this area and in this area, or like you split, split your. Um, MPO kill team into three groups, and then here are the three sections we're going to place now. Something like that. Uh, I think it just you know might benefit. And indeed, I think for some of the scenarios that I'll be looking at down the line, it might be good to detail exactly where things are going to be down, um, and maybe detail what's going to be in the MPO kill team, because we can use those profiles and we can have those uh, kind of generic options kind of detailed already and we can know where each of the models are going to be and then we can work out what out of our model collection will work for it and that would give two players playing the same game more of a kind of aligned experience if that makes sense even if you know one will end up playing um against gene steel cult and the other will end up playing against imperial guard you know because they'll still have the same profiles in the same places with the same behaviors the experience should be similar and they can kind of compare notes all right let's see if 
we can sum all this up. <laughs> this is absolutely a great addition to the game. It, in my opinion, it will be hands down the best way to introduce new players to Kill Team. I think it's something that you could, you know, set up in your local store, get people involved in. Uh, you, yeah, you set up the mission, let them control a few operatives, and then you show them the way with your operatives. And again, you know, people can watch this, people can step in and step out, and um, yeah, you can have a lot of fun just doing it. This is also going to be great for video content, in my opinion. Um, whether that's just recording a cool solo mission or using it as a guide to explain the system. Because the two-player games can be fun to watch, but they can also be a little bit awkward to record. Um, and then often doing this kind of solo play like this can end up with a better story. And then because the the creator doesn't kind of feel the pressure to, to, to you know, quickly get through the game for their opponent instead if they want they can focus on it and spend hours um telling an interesting story and getting all the right shots and kind of doing it that way now personally i'm hoping with this new version of kill team we are going to see players like peachy um you know maybe running guns ghosts up against some xenos like in the same way as he did his series of silver bayonet sharp stories this is something that they could do with kill team too Right now, I'm personally putting together a Tyrannus form, and um, I'll look at maybe painting up Titus and some of his bodies. Obviously, I've got a lot of uh, other space marines that I could use, but you know, with all the content going out there, it sounds like it could be a lot of fun. I'm also wondering if I should get my hands on some Caphias Kane and associated models because I'm a big fan of him and Jurgen. There is still a lot missing, though. Personally, I, I'll be spending a little bit of time tightening up what we have. So when I play it, there'll be less decisions to be made for the MPOs. And then we can have that AI doing as much of the heavy lifting as possible. I'm also going to detail some of the missions. So I'm going to you know work out where I want those MPO profiles to be, where to deploy. And um, even if I don't necessarily you know say what they're going to be um, or put a particular faction to it. I suspect there is some scope to add some special rules in to make up for the lack of command points for the MPOs. Although in cases like that, it is important to have those very, very simple rules so they don't get in the way of playing. We don't want decision points. We don't want it, you know, them to decide when to spend or use the ability or activate it. We want it just to be always on and kind of nice and simple. I'll probably pull out some of the Stargrave and Necromunda books to get some ideas on how I can put these special scenarios together. We still have another week or two before the new rules actually get officially released. And at that point, we should start seeing the PDF versions for the existing kill teams. So that's going to be interesting because it'll give us the kill teams that we can play, but it'll also give us some ideas of, you know, what an enemy kill team will look like. So um, we can look at what the heretic Astartes, the Chaos Space Marines, might look like. So maybe run them as a warrior, uh, sorry, as a marksman or brawler or heavy depending on which kind it is and um, but you can also kind of look and see you know if they've managed to kind of capture the feel of a, a corn berserker better than just using a heavy uh, brawler so maybe there's some kind of twerks or tweaks twerks, tweaks are kind of little things that we could do for it god now there's an image of a corn berserker twerking oh that's gonna stay with me all right and yeah uh and yeah i am gonna try working that tyrannic co-op game and the new Combat Patrol magazine is slowly getting releases. And um, just this week, I did pick up three Von Ryan Leapers. So I'm off to a good start. Hopefully, this video will have given you some ideas on stories you'd like to tell, whether that's solo or co-op. Please do let me know in the comments what you think of the new joint op rules and any suggestions you might have on how we can improve that experience. It has certainly sparked my imagination, which is unfortunate in ways, as I'm partway through multiple other half-done projects. But um, yeah, this is the hobby. This is how this works. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, yeah, as I said, please do comment. Uh, please do like, do all those things. And yeah, have a great week. Thanks for making it all the way to the end. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Each week, I put up a new video talking about one of Games Workshop's specialist games. The goal is always to try and make the best possible two-player experience. If this is something you'd find interesting, please subscribe to the channel and comment to let me know what you'd like to see in future.